the incredible true story of an 18-month-old girl trapped down an abandoned water Jessica. well. Just 18 months old. Jessica. Just hours from death. possible for an 18-month-old child to fall down an 8-inch well? No. 3309 Tanner Drive. Word of Jessica McClure's flight is traveling. While police and emergency personnel are doing all they can to the water well she fell into. God, nothing. Uh, temperature in the wells dropped down to 60 degrees. We're looking at possible hypothermia. How long did you stay down? If you can't raise the temperature, I'm afraid we don't have long at all. We need a miracle is what we need. Damn it. We're gonna get her out. Is there anything I can tell the mother? She's terribly distraught. It is 28 hours now that 18-month-old Jessica McClure has been entombed 22 feet below ground in an abandoned water well. Numerous rescue deadlines have been passed. It's no longer clear when they're going to reach the little girl. Is she making any noise? Can you hear? <coughs> Sounds like she's choking. <coughs> Move your head to the sides, sweetheart. Oh, God. Please don't let her choke. Not now. Get hold of her. Can you get hold of her? <laughs> I don't think we're going to get her out of here, man. I can't get her out! Starring Patty Duke, Bo Bridges, Pat Hingle, and Roxana Zell. The rescue of Jessica McClure. Please don't let my baby die. Mr. Cooperman? Would I lie to you? Come in already. 
She was the sort of woman that made you wish you'd stayed in the shower for an extra minute or taken another three minutes shaving. I felt a little underdressed in my own office. She had what you could call a tailored look. Everything was so understated, it screamed. I could hear the echo bouncing back off the bank across the street. Can I help you, miss? I'm Myrna Yates. Uh-huh. Chester Yates is my husband. The developer. Among other things. He hasn't missed too many opportunities of getting his name in the paper recently. I guess he's had a piece of every real estate deal in and around Grantham for, what, the past 10 years, I guess. Well, I want you to have a seat. How can I help you, Mrs. Yates? It says in the yellow pages you do private investigations. Civil, criminal, industrial, and domestic. I try to cover the field, Mrs. Yates. Although, between the two of us, I uh, let the big boys handle the industrial stuff. Me? I'm just a transom gazer. Divorce is my meat and potatoes. No offense. Frankly, since they've been playing around with the law and divorce, I've had to cut down a little bit on my meat and potatoes. <laughs> So, uh, has this got anything to do with those articles in the newspaper your husband, uh... No, nothing about that at all. May I have a smoke? Oh. I think my husband has been seeing another woman. I'm almost certain of it, Mr. Cooperman, and I want to know for sure. I want to know who it is, and I want dates and times and places. The whole schmear. I get the picture. Uh, tell me, Mrs. Yates, uh... You and your husband quarrel last night? I mean, did something happen maybe this morning? Or... The reason I'm asking is, do you really want a divorce? If you do, there are easier ways of going about it. Mr. Cooperman, I know I could see a lawyer. That is not what I want. Not yet. To see a lawyer at this stage in this town, well, it just... I understand. You're not flying out the window after a fight. You're oyster calm and collected in limited editions. So what makes you think your husband's been playing around, Mrs. Yates? I discovered it by accident to begin with. Discovered what? The lies. Then I confessed to checking up on him. We've never been a deeply loving couple, Mr. Cooperman, but I'm fond of Chester. He has made me very comfortable, and I like that. There were no secrets between us until a couple of months ago. Then he became moody, secretive. Every Thursday, he leaves his building early in the afternoon, and he doesn't return that day. His appointment book says he's at the dentist or city hall. But I've checked, and he isn't there. And when I ask him about it, he lies. Um, you know, my father used to get into a secret gin rummy game down the street, and it took us a long time to figure it out. My mother finally caught him at it. They just celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary, and maybe your husband has got some innocent little... Okay, fine. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to nose around a little bit for a few days. I'm going to clear my desk of all the files I've got and concentrate on this thing. It'll cost you a hundred a day, say for three days, plus expenses. Fine. Well, I'll just get started on this thing. Today is Thursday, Mr. Cooperman. Chester will leave the Cadell building around 2.30. Mm -hmm. Fine. I'll just go down to the Beacon and get a photograph. Thank you. I didn't actually jump across the desk and hug Mrs. Yates. Things hadn't been lively around the office. I'd traced a runaway couple to Buffalo. I'd found evidence that the poor abandoned Mrs. Furstenberg was getting a big one on the side every month from a former basketball all-star. I could do worse than trailing Chester Yates. A guy like that goes into a lot of fancy places in a day.
He pushed one of two buttons. I put my money on the one that wasn't the gynecologist, A. Zeckerman, the psychiatrist. I decided not to call Mrs. Yates with the good news right away. It'd keep. Her husband was faithful. Thank you, Mr. Kirkman. Good afternoon. Where's the divorce business been going all of a sudden? I could think of better things to do with her money than return most of it. I got a license to renew, rent to pay. Why couldn't her old man have somebody out at the Black Duck Motel? What would it hurt him? Hello, Benny. How's the boy? Hiya, Frank. Ah, you're a sight for sore feet. Come on over and have a jar. Yeah, well, I was thinking it was just... Doctor's orders. Pint to play and he's your only bat. The word on the street was that Frank was gay, but to me, he just looked miserable. He drank most of his meals in his office. Sometimes I imagined him off with the gay crowd having a hell of a time. I hoped so, but I doubted it. Around here, Frank was the gay crowd. What are you reading, Benny? Did you look up that Simenon I was telling you about? Oh, he's the deep one. Did you know that Gide was writing about him at the time of his death? Huh. Have you read any Gide at all? Well, actually, I'm still working my way through the Russians. Gogol! Now, this is oh, yours. Sorry. Gogol. It's all in his overcoat, you know that? Whose overcoat? Gogol's. Ah? Frank. Frank, hmm? have you run across a shrink named Zeckerman in your travels? Ah, uh, the affluent Andrew. Big place over in Pelham Road. Irish wolfhound. Foreign cars. Fallen arches. <laughs> Tripped over the crock of gold, says he. Fellas has me destroyed. Okay, well, I'll, I'll be off then, eh? Ma was where I expected to find her, watching television. She'd been there since early afternoon. Come to think of it, she'd been sitting there since 1952. I thought it was you. Your father's playing cards at the club tonight. This is his night to play cards. Your brother should drop in as often as you do. Uh-huh. Did you eat? Yeah, I had a sandwich downtown. Good, because there's nothing to eat around here. That was too bad on the news, wasn't it? What? Too bad. Too bad about what, Ma? About Chester Yates. What are you talking about? I just told you. Oh, Benny. Ma, you, you started to tell me something. I'm just helping you finish. If you tell me what it was, I'll turn the set on again. I cross my heart. Don't get funny with your mother. Ma, for mother. God's sake, would you tell me what it was you heard on the news about Chester Yates, please? He's dead, that's all. What do you mean he's dead? I just saw him this afternoon. Yeah, well, about an hour ago, he put a bullet through his brain. News Cavalcade. From around and of the Grantham region, it's your total news package of News Cavalcade. With tonight's top stories, here's Wally Skate. The death of Chester Yates has left the community in shock. It was security guard Thomas Glassick who discovered the body of the well-known developer in his office on the seventh floor of the Cadell building on James Street. Uh, I was making an uh, early security check at 5.30. I didn't hear anything unusual. No shot, I mean. Mr. Yates' secretary, Martha Tracy, was the last person to see Chester Yates alive. I was the last person to see Mr. Yates alive. He came back to the office just before quitting time. 
Grantham police have removed the target pistol from Mr. Yates' Scarf Enterprises office. Sergeant Joseph Harrow expressed the hope that he would quickly wind up the investigation. Mayor Grantham was shocked by the news, and his executive assistants, William Allen Ward and Alderman Vernon Harrington, had this to say about the well-liked developer. Chester Yates was well-liked and respected. He was dynamic, charitable, and civic-minded. He was a close personal friend, as well as a friend of the whole community. He was a wonderful human being. Chester Yates, dead at 45. In other news tonight, two local men are in the hospital after a three-car pileup on Geneva Street. Here is Ross McQuinney with that report. Two Grantham men are in hospital. Yes? Oh. Hey, Hi. you're Manny Cooperman's boy, aren't you? Yep. <laughs> I thought so. I knew your father. He used to bring you in here when you were a boy. Uh, which one are you? One of you is a doctor, isn't that right? Yeah, I'm Ben. I'm the one that stayed home. I remember the one time your father brought you in here. And I, I remember I asked you. It was during the Korean War, and I asked you, who did you think was going to win? And you said you thought both sides were going to lose. <laughs> How could you beat that? Oh, uh, it was you or your brother. <laughs> yeah, it was my brother. Uh, yeah. uh, anything in particular you're interested in, Ben? Well, I was uh, vaguely looking at the bikes you got in the window. You got some more down. It's Mr. McLeish, isn't it? That's, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, well, my brother's gone, you know. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about that. Oh, well, it's a good many years ago now. They add up more every time I think of them. Yeah. <laughs> You know, a lot of people are riding these safety bikes nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, funny thing, speaking about bikes, yesterday afternoon, I had a customer in here looking at bikes, and he was a dead man by the time I closed up for You're the talking night. about Chester Yates. Oh, how do you know that? That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, isn't that a remarkable thing? Well, I guess anybody can look at a bike, even though he means to shoot himself an hour later. Ben, I agree with you. It might, it, it might calm a desperate man. But looking at a bike is one thing, and buying one's another. What? Buying a 10-speed bike and then killing yourself, oh, that's a totally different can of paint. The case is closed. But it wasn't suicide. I don't think the guy killed himself. You can't argue against fingerprints and powder burns. So you got contact marks and nitrates oh, showing up in the paraffin test. So where's your miscarriage of justice? Oh, but thanks for bringing this to our attention. Without the help of the ordinary citizen like yourself. Uh, yeah, Sergeant Harrow. Sergeant Harrow, what have you got for a motive? Why did he do it? Like it says in the papers, he was depressed and overworked. Yeah, is there going to be an inquest? Look, this is a dead one. If you want to play sleuth, we've got dozens of cases you can go to work on. You don't want to complicate these things, Mr. Uh, sir. Uh, thanks for dropping around. Yeah. I got the cartoon last time. It's your turn. This is Dr. Andrew Zeckerman. I am unable to uh, come to the telephone at the moment. If you would like to uh, leave a message, please do so at the sound of the tone. Please give your name, number, and the time of your call, and uh, I will get back to you as soon as time permits. Scarp Enterprises, good afternoon. Uh, yes, um, Martha Tracy, please. Uh, yes, I wonder if you would let me have her home phone number, please. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but we don't give out that information. Yes, I'm sure you don't, under normal circumstances, but this is an emergency. Who is this, and what do you want? Give me a chopped egg, egg on, on white. white with milk and a vanilla, vanilla sundae to follow your regular, right? Yes. Chopped egg on white. Thank you. I knew a fellow once who wore uh, tinfoil in his shorts to keep the radiation away from his precious jewels.
This is Father Murphy over at St. Jude's. We're after arranging a high mass for dear Martha Tracy's poor, unfortunate employer. May you rest in peace. But Sister Kenny can't seem to find the girl's telephone number at all. Would you be helping us out, Miss, and the blessing of St. Patrick himself be on you for assisting us in this sad business? Will you please stop doing this? We don't give out private numbers. Now, if you keep calling... I took call that hard. Device. I had lines in Finian's Rainbow at school. I was one of the silent singers. I just moved my lips during the songs, but I had real lines. was to try to slip quietly into the Cadell building as the office is emptied at the end of the day. Sometimes I'm lucky in small things. Hey, Benny, how are you? Oh, hi, George, how you doing? How's your brother? I saw his picture in the Toronto paper. It looked great. Great. Well, say hello to Sam for me. Okay, okay. See ya. Take care. trying to find some link with the dead man that would carry me along for another couple of days. All the obvious stuff like address books and his appointment book were with the cops. I was looking for sloppy seconds. Sharp Enterprises, Chester's tidy little firm, looked healthy. It was dipping into new subdivisions and industrial development. Nice going. But the brochure didn't say anything about why Chester Yates had to die to keep it running so smoothly. you to give me the whole story, Mr. Glassick, but in your own words. You mean you're going to write down what I say, then put it in the paper? Absolutely. Oh. I'll tell you what, Tom. Why don't you just move through it? Walk through it for me, just the way you did last night. Okay? And I found him sitting up in the chair there. His head was stretched way back. 
You know, like he was waiting for the dentist to look at his teeth. And the gun was lying there where he dropped it. Here. Yeah. We we're never going to get that out, you know. Oh, and another thing. The bar was open. Oh. There. He had it built specially. Keep a good stock there, didn't he? Eh? You say this was open last night? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I could smell it, too. But, hey, that's off the record. You mean to say that you didn't mention this to anybody last night? No point in adding insult to injury, is there? Tell me something. Did you happen to notice a glass, either half full or empty, sitting on the desk or over here at the bar? Don't think so. No, all the glasses, empty glasses, are on this tray here. You know, he always keeps them lined up like here. See, would, uh, would you like a little, uh... Evidence. Mrs. Yates, this is Benny Cooperman. Oh, yes, Mr. Cooperman. I'm just calling to say how sorry I was to hear about what happened to your husband. Uh, I wonder if we could meet Mrs. Yates to discuss some important business after the funeral, of course. Mr. Cooperman, I don't think we have any business to discuss. It's not about what you think, Mrs. Yates. It's about your husband's death. There are things you should know. I don't want to know details. He didn't kill himself. Is that a detail? What? Look here, Mr. Cooperman. Mrs. Yates is in no condition to discuss business at a time like this. I know I don't want to see her suffer anymore if I can help it. Do I make myself clear? Bill. Let me handle this murder. Mr. Cooperman understands the situation. My business is with Mrs. Yates. Uh, Mr. This is William Allen Ward, Mr. Cooperman. Mrs. Yates is not to be harassed by people just now. I don't want to sound unpleasant. But if you don't get off the line, I will be forced to report this unfeeling behavior. Do we understand each other? Sure, Mr. Ward. But I'll bet Mrs. Yates could tell me to hang up all by herself if she wanted to. Mr. Cooperman, it seems to me I did just that. OK, OK. I'm sorry to have caused the commotion. Martha Tracy? That's the name. Who wants her? My name is Cooperman, Benny Cooperman. I'm a private investigator. Pull the other one. What are you selling? <laughs> no, really. I want to talk to you about Chester Yates. This better be good. I got a belly full of cops, I'll tell you. I don't know how so many people can ask the same dumb question so many times. I hope my questions won't take up too much of your time. Time? Heck, I got nothing but time. They got me on sick leave. It was a shock, you know. I've been with him for more than five years. They always say, ask Martha. She knows where all the bodies are buried. And do you? Well, that's forthright. You're doing fine. Maybe to uh, save your time, I should tell you that I was the last person to see him alive. Uh-huh. When? When I yelled quit in time, it was five to five. Oh, was he alone when you left? Yeah. Did he have a drink going? Was the bar open? <laughs> you know Chester pretty well, don't you? Right, he often had a drink on the way by five. But he'd been out most of the afternoon and only got back to the office at quitting time. So he shot himself with an unclouded brain, if that's what your little head is thinking. Did you notice anything missing from the office? You should get points off for leading the witness. I've got coffee, if you don't mind instant. There's another kind? 
Don't get any ideas. I got slacks on under here. There was a bar towel gone. I opened at the bar myself. Got the set of eight glasses from Burks. Kept the sink clean. Trays full. Black? A uh, black, yeah. That's eight glasses in a set? Yeah. Did Chester ever use the words C2? Did you ever hear him say that? C2? Yeah. Nope. No. Must have slipped that under the door while I was drinking my lunch. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> Tell me something, Martha. Was he on the edge? Was he really all that depressed? There you go, leading the witness again. Between you, me, and the gatepost, Chester wasn't depressed enough to kill himself. If he was in a corner of some kind, he was more the type to worm his way out of it or change the rules or something. I thought I knew him pretty well, but... Yeah. Dr. Zuckerman? Yeah. Blasted sump pump gave out. I think there's something stuck right about here, but I'm not sure. You know anything about this, Mike? No, not that kind. Uh, I worked on the mother for three hours, and I just can't get it cleared out. Yeah. Uh... Now, you put the flame just about here. I'll see if I can loosen up the son of a... If a clod gets in there, it's... No, leave the flame there. Come on, heat it up. All right. That's right. There. That might have done it. Shove it down. Yeah. That's it. Huh? <laughs> You're not the plumber. No, I'm Benny Cooperman. I'm a private investigator. I'm working on the Chester Yates case. What Chester Yates case? I don't know any Chester Yates. Sure you do, doctor. He was your patient. You saw him just before he died. Who are you? I just told you, I'm Benny Cooperman. Who the hell sent you here? Nobody. Now, who are you working for? Don't give me any garbage. I told you, I'm a private investigator. In the ground you are. Now, you just turn around and walk out of here right now, understand? And stop following me. Would, would you calm down a second? I just want to ask you a couple of... Would you... Get out of here, right now! Would you cut that out? Just get, get out that of away. my property I'm, right now. I'm going to try to get out. If you're standing in the way of the door, I'll get out of here, right now. Mr. Cooperman? Yeah. Oh, Mrs. Yates. I'm sorry to bother you. Oh, that's, that's all right. What, uh... Could you close the door? The door, sure, yeah. It's about what you said on the telephone. Oh, ah. Uh, well, I've stopped harassing people, Mrs. Yates. I've turned over a new leaf, believe me. I'm sorry about the phone. It was a very difficult situation. Neither of us could say anything. We've all been under a great deal of strain. Well, you know, maybe it was me. Maybe I just called at the wrong time. Mr. Cooperman, please. You said Chester didn't kill himself. I think. I can't prove it. I've tried going to the cops, but they say I need more proof than I've got. You see, what I've got is... is shaky. Believe me, Mrs. Yates, somebody's trying to make it look like Chester shot himself. Who? I don't know. But I'd very much like to help. That is, if you want to keep me busy. Because, frankly, I haven't got enough right now to make a fuss about. But if you want to drop the whole thing right now, then I can take a hint. Just give me the word. I'm here, aren't I? 
I want to know what happened. Okay. Let's go back two days, Thursday. Your husband was not paying a call on another woman. Your husband, Mrs. Yates, was keeping an appointment at a psychiatrist's office. Chester? He was seeing a psychiatrist all those Thursday afternoons. But everything pointed to him. Dr. Andrew Zeckerman. Zeckerman. The name mean anything to you? No, it was he, though. And when I just mentioned your husband's name, he got very excited about something. Why? I don't know why. That's what I'd like to... All find. right, Mr. Cooperman. I want you to keep me informed. But I don't want my name used. You'll have to trust me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God to take unto himself the soul of our brother here departed, we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection and eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I heard you'd be here. They think I might steal the floral tributes, Pete? <laughs> sure are enough of them. Seems a waste. Uh, I guess somebody makes a buck from it. I didn't know you had a philosophical side. Where's the rest of Grantham's finest? Or does Chester Yates only rate one sergeant? Or are you a mourner, maybe? This isn't official, Benny. Sure. Benny. No, you're invisible. I can put my finger right through you. Benny. What do you take me for? I mean, who told you to come down here then and tiptoe through the tombstone, huh? Come on, if you can't trust a guy used to bum your geography notes, who can you trust? What's eating them downtown? What are they so worried about? Look, I can get in a lot of trouble for telling you anything. What you've been saying all over town about Yates's death being murder and not suicide, you've got a lot of very important people feeling uneasy. Oh. Like, like you'll take advantage of the funeral to make a speech or point the guilty finger, oh, stuff like that. Now, listen, it doesn't worry me, see, because we go back a long way together. But some people worry easy. Benny. Yeah? Do I have to spell it out for you? Why don't you try putting a couple of numbers together, like two and two? If what I'm doing didn't get so many people worked up, then I might leave it alone. But people yeah, don't get this anything. excited without a reason. That reason could be that there's more to this than yesterday's lunch. Did anybody ever worry about Benny Cooperman before? I just started kicking the tires on this thing, suddenly all hell breaks loose. No, no all hell would break loose if Harrow was on your ass instead of me. Come on, they're just worried about Myrna Yates. It's what they call being protective. Now do yourself a favor and let it lie. I bet you don't even have a client. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. Hello, Cooperman. Mr. Cooperman? Andrew Zeckerman. So, Dr. Zeckerman. You've decided I'm not trying to murder you after all? Well, I can explain that. And I certainly want to apologize for my unwarranted attack on you. Well, the occasional attack, you know, keeps me on my toes. <laughs> what we were talking about uh, when I saw you last, I was just trying to find out how long you've known Chester Yates. Uh, since last spring, about a year, he was my patient. His death, Mr. Cooperman, has upset me terribly. Ooh, you never lost a patient before, Doctor. He was with me an hour before he died. That hit me very hard. I was fond of Chester. So he didn't leave your place in a suicidal depression, then? Of course not. I didn't think so, either. You think somebody got to him, don't you? Yes, I do. I know it. That's why I've got to talk to you. Could you meet me here at my office at, say... at, say, uh, 6 o'clock? I'll explain everything. Will that be satisfactory? It'll have to be. Okay, I'll see you at 6. <laughs> I had an appointment with him at about...
about six o'clock. Yeah, you know, he's he usually in. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I... Sergeant Stasiak of the Criminal Investigations Branch. Don't. There goes my job. Just get the cops! Find some. I saw that Zeckerman's current appointments had been ripped from the fancy leather binder. I tried my best not to catch the eye of the good doctor. I didn't want to repeat the little scene I just played in the bathroom. The further away I got from the body, the better. His filing cabinet was just right. The murderer had emptied the file on Chester Yates. On a hunch, I looked up William Allen Ward. So much for hunches. Alderman Vernon Harrington, no less. Very nice. I bet he doesn't put this into his campaign literature. to meet at six o'clock. I came here, I found that. I'm not one of his patients. I knew he wanted to tell me something. About what? Here we go. About Chester Yates's death. You were bothering him with the same stuff you came to me with last week. I told you three times. He called me. I never got a chance to find out what he wanted to tell me, obviously. You're not gonna leave this alone, are you, Cooperman? Leave what alone? You know what I'm talking about, you two-bit snooper. Who the hell do you think you are? You can't operate in this province without a license, Cooper. Hmm? The registrar's been receiving an earful of complaints about the way you operate. Clean up your act or lose your license. <laughs> I'd like to know more about your husband and Dr. Zuckerman. It's a terrible thing that happened to him. It's terrible. Two lumps. Please. I generally take four lumps, but in circumstances like this, I settle for two. She was able to make me feel that three lumps was a social gaffe unto be forgiven, and that four would necessitate my removal from the house at once. Tell me, Mrs. Yates, what was your reaction when I told you that your husband was seeing a psychiatrist? I knew you must be mistaken. I'm still very sure of that. I think I would have known if Chester was in delicate mental health. Not necessarily. I could always tell within a hair's breadth when Chester would crack. I'm sure it wasn't his business. Oh, thank you. And uh, what about your private lives? Chester was never the sort of man to play around, Mr. Cooperman. That's not what you thought last Thursday. True. Normally, Chester wouldn't look at another woman. Chester and Bill Ward had played follow the leader throughout their lives. They were pals, eh? They were not pals, Mr. Cooperman. 
He was my husband's best friend. They grew up together, went to the same schools, summer camps, belonged to the same clubs. Even in business until recently, they were as thick as... <laughs> this year, when Bill took a mistress or girlfriend, whatever you call it these days, I... Well, I feared naturally that... Tell me more about this girlfriend of Ward's. What's she got to do with anything? Well, her name was Pamela Tilford. She was a secretary at my husband's office. She was a mildly good-looking redhead, medium height, about 30, with very little sense of what to wear in an office. I don't know where she is now. Ward is broken-hearted? Bill has a way of getting over heartbreak. You mustn't imagine that Pamela Tilford was the first. He's married, isn't he? Yes, to my friend Mary Lee. But she has learned to keep him on a long leash. A very long leash. When it's long enough, Mr. Cookman, you don't even know it's there. Oh, thank you for the tea. And, uh, the thing. Ms. Yates, would I be very wrong in guessing that you're in love with Bill Ward? You really are a detective, Mr. Cookman. Yes, I'm in love with Bill. I thought I hid it better. But then I've always loved him. Good afternoon, Mr. Cookman. Sid? I won't say one good thing about it. Oh, please, don't give me an argument. I just want breakfast. Can I have lox and cream cheese on a bagel, please? And my coffee, too, to go. How about if I give you that on a muffin? Muffin? Dr. Zeckerman. I don't know what I felt most. The creeps opening a parcel from a dead man, or amazement that it had gone through the postal service so quickly. just more questions. There were notes in the doctor's handwriting that only another doctor could figure out. I'd get Frank Bushmill to help me. The clipping made the most sense. It was about a suicide up at Secord University over 10 years ago. A kid named Elizabeth Blake took an overdose of sleeping pills, mourned by Ma, Pa, and her sister Hilda. Are they the girls in the picture? Which one's Hilda and which the suicide? I could only guess. Damn it, Dr. Zeckerman, I know you were trying, but you forgot to enclose your crystal ball. Well, now you know my secret, you little snoop. But you can't let the furry beggars starve, can you? And besides, they're too dumb to remember where they hid their nuts. Well, all I got is pocket fuzz, sorry. Last thing we need is more fuzz, Benny. 
So, Martha, what do you got for me? They uh, asked me to come in this morning to clear up the junk in Mr. Yates's office. I've been knee-deep in carton since 9 o'clock. Well, I ran across something peculiar. You're the expert on peculiar, so I called you. Isn't that the damnedest? There's no order to it. Some of the appointments are in the middle of the night. Isn't that cotton-picking weird, Cooperman? It's his handwriting, all right. He's double-booked the same hour four to five times. And the names, it's like he made them up. He doesn't know a Harney. Uh, did you tell anybody else about this? Of course not. Think I never watch television? Do you mind if I hang out for a few days? Martha, I want to ask you about a girl who used to work in your office by the name of Pamela Tilford. Does that name ring any bell? I only wish they'd stop. I put her up after she came to work for us. She stayed six months and left owing me two months' rent. I can scarcely manage the mortgage as it is, and she leaves without a word. Well, when was the last time you saw her? Two months ago. I thought she'd been fired because Mr. Yates spent part of the day talking to her in his office. That was the last time I saw her. She never came back. Well, somebody must know where she is. I mean, what, did anybody call the police about her or anything? Well, Chester asked me if I thought I should report her as a missing person, but hell, she didn't seem to me to be the sort of girl to get herself murdered. She didn't leave much behind in her room. A few clothes, a few books. As a roommate, she was next door to living alone. Still, she could have said goodbye. So what do you think, Cooperman? Has she been bumped off, too? Well, Martha, when I find out, you'll be the first to know. Sophie, where's your soup? You know I never eat soup. You ask me that every night. Here, Manny. Give Benny the rare one. You know he likes his rare. Yeah, which one? Phoebe Campbell, I work at the Upper Canadian Bank. Oh. A, a friend gave me your name. Oh. <laughs> well, I hope he doesn't want a commission. What? I'm, I'm sorry? Don't mind me. I work at driving people away. <laughs> Here, let me help you off with your coat. Thank you. <sighs> okay. Mr. Cooperman, I hope that you can help me. If you can't, I don't know what I'll do. Well, uh, I try my best to do my duty. Yeah. Uh, don't mind them. Uh, my father used to be in business. Oh. Ladies ready to wear. He's been promising for two years to get rid of that stuff. You may talk freely in front of them. <laughs> Please, sit down. Uh, I've, I've been in Grantham for just a few months. Uh, I work at the Upper Canadian Bank. Oh, I guess I already told you that. Uh, I'm just a teller there, but it, it was there that I met someone, and th that's how I got into this mess. <laughs> you can guess that the person I met was a man. Well, we were just friends at first, but later... Oh, I, I'm having difficulty, Mr. Cooperman. Must I go into details? Let's just say that I can guess the next part. Thank you. Um, we used to go to a house here in the city in the evenings, and he gave me things, uh, jewelry mostly. Nicest I've ever seen. Not that I'm a judge. 
I was quite bowled over. And last week he, he told me about his wife. I'm not blaming him, Mr. Cooperman. I just want to get clear of it and start again. I think we've come to the part that you want me for. Yes? Okay. I, I want you to return the jewelry he gave me. I don't want to see it anymore. You want me to the post office give you a hard time? No, I just want to put back where it belongs, and that no messenger or postman could do. I'll pay you a for course. Bellevue Crescent. Who lives there? I'd rather not give his name. Um, here's the key to get in. I don't need it anymore either. It's the back door. Oh. Um, if you would just put the package in the night table in the main upstairs bedroom. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> uh, you're going a little too fast, Miss uh, Campbell. I'd like to ask you a few questions first, if I may. You don't believe me, do you? The lady, your money looks real. If you believe it, that's good enough for me. I'll show you what's in the box. No, that's not necessary. I'd probably open it myself later anyway. Yes, well. I can see that the post office is out. Why me? I think I can trust you. If you find difficulty with it, Mr. Kuhlman, I'll try and find another way. I'll do it. I'll do it. Oh. <laughs> oh, when you when you finished, mm -hmm. would you call me? A, a, oh, this. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this number. Right, right, that number. Okay, mm -hmm. and this is the key. When do you think you'd be able to call me? I don't know. About ten thirty or so. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, well, I paid you in advance. Yes, you Mr. have. Kaufman, so there's no need for us to meet again. I, nothing personal, of course. No, no, I understand. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> There's just one thing more. You forgot to give me the package. Oh. Thank okay. you. Yes. Okay. Take care.
jewelry, huh? Little something for your charm bracelet? This is everything, huh? That's what we got. So, you ran into officers Kyle and Bedrosian. Uh, they, they checked out your client's phone number. It, uh, it turned out to be a Chinese restaurant on Niagara Street, a payphone. So your uh, Phoebe Campbell is made of smoke, bin. So, finally got something on you, didn't we? Good on us. You're not working tonight, Joe. Oh, it's not work when I can watch this. Couldn't leave it alone, could you, Peeper? I'll take care of it, Joe. You know what? You just made my day. Good, good. See you later. Let this slam that door on his fingers. Maybe throw him an electric toaster when he's in the shower. Don't worry about it. I don't chip easy. The hell with you. This is my investigation. Where the hell does he get off thinking that he can stick his snout into this? <clears throat> Never mind. Your client, your, your client, your fictional client is not on any known list of names, including census. You know, in a way, you're lucky that your story is so crazy, because we hear all kinds in a week, Benny, but yours wins the prize. But let me tell you something. If any of this had checked out, in spite of everything, I would nail you to the wall on a B and E in a minute. Fortunately for you, it all stinks to high heaven. And I know you well enough to know that all of this thing doesn't come from you. So think, Benny. Why? Why would anybody want to set you up like this? Somebody doesn't like me? No, no, besides me. All right, we're going to check out this piece and see where that leads us. In the meantime, there's not very much between you and a night in the slammer, Benny. Kyle, you punching out? Yeah, I should have hours ago. Well, take uh, Mr. Cat Burglar here back to his car. It's on your way, and then all of you get the hell out of here. Let's see what kind of... Good night. Good night, Cat Burglar. Frank? had been gone over by someone who knew what they were looking for. Zuckerman's unreadable notes were missing. Good luck. Thanks, also. So you take the car and I can look to the shore. Oh, here, Tom. Yeah, I'm not sure. You didn't go home last night like a good boy, did you? No. I went to the office. Somebody had already been there. I have been robbed, by the way. And Frank Bushmill, my neighbor, must have interrupted them. Yeah. It kind of makes sense now, doesn't it? If that sense. Are you going to talk to him? I already did. You can go in if you want. Benny, look, um, up until a few hours ago, I thought that you'd just been watching too much television. But now with this and a few other things, uh, I think you better be careful. Bill Ward has big teeth. Ward? What has he been doing, putting matches under your nails, Pete? Benny, Bill Ward owns the house that you broke into. Oh, it's you, is it? It was 
it's for the love of you, Dr. Cooperman, that I got this wallop on the side of my head. Oh. How does it feel? Like an ingrown toenail of the brain. Athlete's foot of the cerebellum is very rare. What happened? Oh, I was sitting in my office trying to decide whether to cut my throat or buy an expensive dinner when I heard a noise from your office. But I thought it was you, Ben, and I was hoping for a word or two. Mm -hmm. I uh, may have called out your name as I came out of my own shop. Your door stood wide open, but the, uh, the room was empty. And the last thing I remember hearing before the stars came out and danced a mazurka on me medulla oblong at her. I was wondering where you disappeared to. Hmm. Do you remember anything else? I seem to recall something just a second before the wallop. He, he must have been behind the door. Well, how long are they going to put up with you here? I resent that. Oh, the process of unhandling the human brain takes time. The nurses, of course, show no respect. I'll steal you some flowers. <laughs> Dr. Cooperman, you have my dying voice. Poor bugger. I didn't know Chester was on his gaff, too. Zeckerman didn't have patience. Only people he squeezed. He must have squeezed too hard. Blackmail's a dirty game, Mr. Cooperman. If you're taking up his practice, you'll never know when you squeezed your last sucker. It's over that fast. You seem to know a lot about it. He made me crawl to him every week with my money. We'd go through the motions, sitting in his big leather chairs, He'd ask me how I felt about paying him. <laughs> and that by paying him, I was helping to atone for what he knew about my past. Did he ask you about Chester Yates? He asked about city politics. Did he know about C2? Core 2, yeah, he knew about that. But I didn't tell him. He didn't find out from me. But who else would know about Core 2? Me, the mayor, and of course, Bill Ward. Of course. And Chester, right? Certainly not. He was in a position to make a pyre. Would have been most improper for him to know anything about it. This it? Look, the city's been secretly examining plans for a satellite business center and city hall branch. The actual location and details of the project are still highly confidential. I found out about it from Chester. Your security, Mr. Harrington, has sprouted a very expensive leak. I knew you'd get around to your price. What do you want? Zeckerman was the blackmailer. I'm only interested in who killed your pal. Chester Yates, remember him? If I were you, Vern, isn't it? You should get some electric trains for this thing, Vern.
me a minute, but then, under the long hair and headbands, I recognized the youthful faces of Bill Ward and Chester Yates. School days up at Secord University a decade ago. There was that story about Elizabeth Blake, the young suicide, and her boyfriend who jumped off a balcony of the chemistry building, both good friends of Ward and Yates. An item about a security guard getting wounded during a drug warehouse robbery. I got the feeling that I had all the pieces. Anybody have any glue? Mr. Cooperman! Yeah?
there are some invitations you just can't say no to. So what was I gonna do, plead a subsequent engagement? Anyway, I went along for the ride without kicking up a fuss. I had a feeling that I was about to get my first up-close look at William Allen Ward's shining big teeth. You don't know very much, Cooperman. Not when it comes to courts of law. <sighs> See, the thing is, Mr. Ward, I got to the potting shed ahead of your boys. They shouldn't play with matches. I found out Zuckerman knew all about your final year at Secord University. He knew all about Elizabeth Blake. What do you know about that? Zuckerman's files don't skip much. Corso was in on it. And you also know that Corso was the man that made the stuff. He had access to one of the labs. Chester and I stayed absolutely clear of any of that. Elizabeth Blake was Corso's girl. She was crazy. I called her the crazy redhead. Chester and I were only interested in making a bit of spending money, so we sold as much acid as Corso could make. It's not like we were professional drug pushers. It was a school prank, really. Right, here, just kids. Except that your crazy redhead died, didn't she? Elizabeth Blake died. Yeah. Yeah. Elizabeth Blake. Why'd you kill her, Bill? I mean, it wasn't like that. It was not like that at all. She was always getting herself twisted and more twisted. And then one night, Corso called us. He couldn't bring Lizzie down. She raved for hours and then collapsed. But there was something funny about her breathing. Corso went to pieces, as usual. So Chester and I had to take her back to her room. I emptied a vial of pills I found on her table into my pocket. I figured if she died, we'd need a smoke screen. Nothing like this had ever happened to us before. We both came from good families. Good for you. You're such a decent chap. Mr. Corso, he wasn't such a respectable member of the community, was he? Jumped over a building. Spineless bastard. He got scared. It was all just too much for him. And then he missed getting that scholarship. Yeah, that's very convenient. Cooperman, I hope you're not suggesting... I'm not suggesting anything. I'm telling you, I'll make it really plain. You and Chester, you killed him. You grabbed his legs over the rail. I bet you were in the elevator before he hit the ground. But I don't mean to suggest anything. Mr. Ward, to me, you're not the center of the universe. I used to be able to live for hours at a time without hearing your name. I liked it like that. I look forward to going back to that. I have got to insure my interests, Mr. Cooperman. No one knows you're here. People have accidents all the time. Oh, well, I was wondering when you were going to come up with that. Accidents. Accidents can be insured. I'm a big believer in life insurance. <laughs> you didn't set up this meeting. Are you a card-playing man? Because if you are, you know there are times when you have to put your money where your mouth is. You're right, I didn't arrange this meeting. You arranged this meeting, but I expected it. When you expect things in my business, you take out insurance. What kind of insurance? Some things didn't burn up with a potting shed. And a letter to be opened in case of my death or sudden disappearance or something like that. And they're in hands of no one to do. I see you're bluffing. Good. It takes more opinions than one to make a poker game. Chester's mysterious list of appointments was stuck in my craw like locks on a muffin. I knew that once I'd cracked the puzzle or code or whatever it was, I'd be home free and laughing. Jehip, 
chicka hey a hepper dip a fober. Terrific. Roof. Chopstick salad on white. Now, are you going to have a milkshake with that or just milk today? I'll tell you when I get there. I hope those aren't your appointments. Why? Well, you'd be killing yourself with uh, work like that. Nobody wants to work that hard. It's crazy the way they go around the clock like that. Suicide, that's what it around is. Around the clock. I think you just made my day. Catch a tempting match. Zed wants in for a third. Zed wants in for a third. That's it. <laughs> I love you. Wait. I have this for you. No, this is for me. No, please. No, I need this desperately. I have writing on it. Thank you very much. Uh. Zuckerman wanted to yeah. split the illegal profits that Chester and Yates were going to split between them. Illegal, illegal. profits. I understand, yes. Now, right. Zuckerman was willing to play for this new office piece. Zuckerman was willing look. to play for petty cash. But as soon as big bucks were involved, core two, core two. then he was going to lean on them a little bit harder. You get yeah, it? Well, nobody's going to share in the illegal profits, Ben. Yeah, because uh, we found out in time. No. We're going to nail Ward in time. No, no. There isn't going to be any three-way spook. Where's Chester? Lynn Zuckerman, and now William Allen Ward. Oh, terrific way to start the day. Thank you for sharing that with me. Ah, sweet smell of success, Benny. Can I, uh, go ahead? Where'd they find him? In the garage of the house on Bellevue Crescent. In his car, the door closed and the motor running. Neighbor called this morning. Engine was running all night. The tank was nearly dry. They're calling it suicide. Suicide? Yeah. Well, Ward's passing left me with the names of three women on my mind. Were they mourning or cheering? Elizabeth Blake was beyond caring, but what about Pamela Tilford and Phoebe Campbell? Tilford used to live with Martha Tracy. I thought I'd take a look. Plutarch, Shaw, Cicero, Rousseau. Your friend Pamela Tilford was quite a gal. Weird, eh? What was she like? I hear she was good looking. What do you expect me to say? She had all the right equipment and just the right proportions. Red hair, long legs, nice mouth. I'd show you her picture, but she avoided office parties like they gave you herpes, which they do. <laughs> she was a loner, but she was out for a big game. Like Ward? For a little guy, you get around. She played him smart, like a trout fisherman. Never saw her drool once, thought it was all his idea, that kind of smart. She didn't go out unless it was with him. Never talked about herself. I always suspected that if he didn't pay attention in a restaurant, he'd order for one. No. No. She didn't leave much stuff. Still, there was something about her. If you ever find her, tell her to forget the back rent. One Crescentwood Road. I'm living on the moon. I guess I'm here to stay. Hello, Mr. Cooperman. I've been expecting you since this morning. You've got lots of company. <laughs> Can you imagine anyone named Blake keeping birds in cages? My mother does. Blake said everything that lives is holy. Do you believe that, Mr. Kuberman? Yes. Yeah. I guess I do, in a way. Yes. I used to believe that, and a hundred other beautiful things that I've put behind me. I'm cut off from fine sentiments now, but I do feel the wound. You want to tell me about it? Oh, yes, I will. First, would you like something from the thermos? Uh.
Please, Mr. Cooperman. I am not that sort of person. Do you really think I intend to poison you? Well, I've got to admit I might have some reason to be cautious. I wouldn't do anything now that would spoil what I've already done. You are not a part of my mission, Mr. Cooperman. Elizabeth and I were very close, of course. Even though I was younger, I always tried to keep up with her. She was a first-class student all her life. I think she was a genius. Then suddenly, one day, she just wasn't there anymore. She was only 20, Mr. Cooperman. She had so much to give to life, and they, they spoiled it. They murdered her. You knew that she was taking drugs, though, didn't you? Oh, yes, but she was never an addict. Everybody was doing it then. It was a part of growing up. Don't you see that? Oh, no, I see that. I also see that she was a little bit more than an innocent victim of these pushers. She was part of that little group that was making and distributing the drugs. She was there when the security guard was wounded with that gun that you gave me. She was very special like the rest of us. She wasn't a bit like what you're thinking. She cried in my arms that night. She never needed me before. For a while, it was as if she was me and I was her. She was in love with Joe. They worked in a lab together. He was brilliant. He could do anything. She told me how they were often up all night waiting for the results of a group of tests. You don't believe me, do you? I'm having a little difficulty accepting the hero status that you're giving both of them. They were either in it for the kicks or for the money, and if they would have been caught, would have been jail for both of them. You don't understand how what happened next wiped all of that away. Well, they robbed a drug warehouse. They came within an ace of killing the guard, and then they just kept on making and pushing the stuff, right? Have you ever seen pictures on the television or a newspaper of the women of accused men walking to or from the courtroom? Have you studied the faces of those women of, as I have? They show hatred at the camera with their eyes. Questions of right and wrong are for courts and strangers. They have no place under the roof of the accused. <laughs> You want to tell me about your mission? Mother was too ill to go to the funeral, so I went. I tried to tell the people what had happened, but they took me away. I can't remember who it was. But I remember vowing over her coffin that I would not let Chester Yates and Bill Ward get away with what they did. I'd do it to them. And I'd make it look like they did. Make their deaths look like suicide. We Blakes are special. I had to do it. They murdered her and escaped all shadow of blame. That was my mission, Mr. Cooperman. I knew that I would live long enough to send them both to hell.
On the day of Chester's funeral, I had an appointment with Dr. Zeckerman. He was upset about Chester. He looked frightened of me. He didn't accuse me, but uh, he said he sent you things. And he, he called them his bulletproof vest. Yeah, uh, why did you get mixed up with Zeckerman in the first place? He was my therapist. He must have found you a fascinating patient. Dr. Zeckerman was a blackmailer. He was using you as a source for information on Yates and Ward. I don't know why he pushed himself in uninvited. He had no special purposes I had, but I did not kill him. You believe me, Mr. Cooperman? Yep. Bill Ward killed him. His special purpose was money. You're mocking me. You didn't know what Zeckerman sent me, but you knew you had to get it back before you turned your full attention on Bill Ward. And while I was off getting arrested, Bellevue Crescent, you were in my office. My neighbor came in, you hit him, too, very professionally. And then called Bill Ward last weekend, and he took you out. I guess you laughed at his jokes, played up to him a little bit, and then he took you to the Bellevue Crescent house. Do you despise me for that? I don't enter into it at all. I'm just an investigator. I'm not a judge or a jury. You think it was a low trick to take advantage of them that way? I can tell. I sacrificed myself as well as them. You must see that. feared being caught, I expected that. But I was afraid of the story getting twisted, that they dismissed me as a lunatic. I was hoping that there'd be time to explain things. I'm glad it was you, Mr. Cooperman. Oh, what is your Christian name? My first name is Ben, but I'm Jewish. Ben. <laughs> I like that name, it suits you. Ben. I'm glad it was you, Ben. I know now that what I did will not be misunderstood. That's some satisfaction. Ben. I want you to have something. It was my sister's. I've always loved it. Something to remember. I feel quite calm now. What are you going to do now, Ben? You know very well.
She didn't have any call to do this. Well, what can you do? You explained it. It makes sense to me. But she didn't have to do this. I knew there was nothing I could do to stop her. It's all part of that plan she had. I mean, you saw those books that she was reading? All about noble self-sacrifice or revenge? Charlotte Corday, Medea, what's her name? St. Joan. Yeah. There are still some tangled ends that I'd like to figure out on long summer evenings. One thing's clear. Hilda said she'd send Ward and Yates to hell, and she did it. But she didn't count on her revenge still working away like a mother of vinegar. Both men have been totally discredited. The old Grantham family crests are falling off the wall. Now, revenge isn't something over and done with. It's a continuing thing. I don't think even Hilda counted on that. My town is your town Don't try and get out of my sight Not tonight Cause my town is your town And girl, I'm gonna find you tonight My time is your time That my time is your time Could we get together tonight I'm still living in this town And when it gets me down I remember how you were Just before you changed before you faded like the day Before you knew That my town is your town Don't try and get out of my sight Not tonight My town is your town And girl, I'm going to get you tonight 